Hi, Mahir Samson. Hi, Pim. Hi. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Yes, it's a pleasure. It's my pleasure. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you. And uh, we've got lots of people very much looking forward to your talk. Yes, I saw that. I'm very happy with it. Yeah, I hadn't expected it. But it's very nice. And it's nice that there is so much uh, interest in, uh, in the subject because I think it's an important subject. Mm. But of course, it's nice that a lot of people join us, uh, even though it's through Zoom. Yeah, I, I don't think I've done a lecture as large as this uh, before or through Zoom. Yeah, I guess we're, we're all getting very used to it now. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And uh, thanks, thanks to Samson for looking after things today. Oh, thank you, Bill. Uh, people uh, have joined us through the webinar and Zoom, and uh, we'll be pretty much ready to start when you're ready, Bill. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, well, I, I think you can just do the introduction, right, Samson? Uh, no, you're going to do it. Oh, am I? You see how, how organized we are here. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, should we get started? Yes, please. Yes. Okay, well, look, we're uh, very excited to have uh, Professor Pim Kuypers uh, from uh, uh, Amsterdam joining us uh, today. Uh, Pim is a world expert in uh, various aspects of clinical psychology, um, and we're really interested in developing a kind of deeper relationship with him and his group. And so uh, with that in mind, given that currently uh, you know, travel between various places in the world, between Holland and uh, Hong Kong, uh, is, is tricky. Uh, we've scheduled a couple of seminars, and he's been very kind to and generous with his time uh, to schedule those for us. So we've got one today, uh, moderated by uh, our uh, dear friend and colleague, Professor Sampson C. And then uh, in uh, a month's time or so, uh, we have another one, uh, and that'll be uh, moderated by uh, Dr. Christian Chan. Um, so, uh, so uh, I won't uh, take up any, any more of your time, but just say we're very, very grateful to have Professor Kuypers with us and uh, really looking forward to his talk. Oh, thank you, uh, Professor Dean Hayward. And um, again, our very warm welcome goes to uh, Professor Kuypers. What I would like to suggest to do is uh, while Professor Kuypers uh, delivers uh, his lecture, uh, I would like to invite everyone, not only attending, uh, listening, and uh, enjoying the lecture, but at the same time, I encourage you to, to post your questions. Uh, in the set there is a Q&A uh, corner. You can post your questions there. The rundown for today is uh, Professor Kuypers will speak for about 45 minutes. They will give us a good 30 minutes for Q&A. That will be the very exciting part in addition to the lecture. How does this sound, guys? Okay, so very welcome to everyone. Good afternoon from Hong Kong, uh, no matter where you are. So, uh, Professor Kuypers, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to give this talk. For me, it's in the morning. For you, it's in the afternoon. Um, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to give this talk. Uh, because I'm looking forward to, uh, to collaborate with uh, uh, your university in Hong Kong, but also because this is an important subject, especially in times of Corona. I think we have to work on other ways of delivering psychological interventions than only through face-to-face -face, uh, contacts. And that's why I think delivery of psychological interventions through the internet is highly important. And I will now start sharing my screen so that you can see my slides. So here we are and I will uh, start my PowerPoint. I hope you can see that uh, now. So what I, what I will do, I will talk today about internet-based interventions for common mental disorders. I will mostly focus on depression because it, uh, I could give comparable talks about anxiety disorders, which are very, which would be very much the same. Uh, but I think it's better to focus mostly on depression because we know most about depression and it won't, uh, the, then my message will be 
less complicated. So what I will do, uh, I, I hope you can still see my screen despite all the small, uh, 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 my, my own uh, camera. But um, what I will do is so I will firstly brief, talk briefly about very general subject, how you can improve treatments of depression. Uh, that's important as a starting point because that has some kind, some limitations if we really want to uh, make things better. Then I want to focus on psychological treatments of depression. What do we know about them? And I will give a very few uh, uh, comments and a gen very general overview. And then I will focus more on internet interventions. How do they compare with face-to-face -face therapies? And as I will, as I hope to show you, is that it really doesn't matter which format you use when you deliver psychological treatments for depression. You can do that individually in groups, uh, by telephone, uh, but also through the internet. Uh, however, that's very uh, efficacy knowledge. We know that from randomized trials, but that doesn't mean it works always and everywhere. I and mean, you have to examine where and how you can use that knowledge. And I will go with you briefly through areas where we can apply that knowledge. And then I will give an, a few examples of the research projects I was involved in in the last couple of years to showcase the type of research and the questions we are focusing uh, on when we work with internet interventions. And finally, I will talk about the future because the future is changing rapidly. And in many ways, internet interventions are old fashioned. They are traditional. And we see now the field moving very quickly towards uh, the mobile revolution, so to say. And I, I will say a few words about that. So let's start with the first point, how to improve treatments of depression. I wrote a paper about that, a viewpoint paper two years ago in JAMA. Uh, so if you wanna read more about it, you should read this paper. But what I basically try to say is that our treatments for depression, they are effective, but the effects are limited. That doesn't mean it's very different from other treatments in the biomedical field. But treatments are not that effective. The, the effects are quite modest. And the problem is, on the one hand, a lot of people get better anyway. You don't have to treat them. You see large numbers of people responding to placebo or just trying to solve problems themselves. On the other hand, you have a large group of people who don't respond to anything and you can treat them with anything you have, and you can treat, try this and that and another thing, and they still don't respond. So what we can do with treatments is actually in the field in between. So in between the people who don't need treat treatment because they uh, get better anyway, and the people who don't respond at all to any treatment. And our treatments, they actually work in the field between. And what you, if you look at that field, then you see that the effects are actually pretty modest. So for example, the response rate in placebo is 38%. While when you take antidepressive medications, that's 54%. And that's so the difference is only 16%. And to say that you have comparable figures for a psychotherapy. So um, our treatments are effective, but the effects are modest. And so we have to find ways either to make treatments better or to make them more efficient, that we can apply treatments in a more limited way. And that's where low intensity interventions come in. That's where internet interventions come in. These are an important step towards making interventions more efficient. We can, uh, we can deliver interventions for less resources than in traditional treatments. <clears throat> and that 
allows to treat more people with the same money that we can do than we do now. So that's what I want to start with uh, as, a, as a starting point for my presentation. So I will switch now to the next part of my talk, that psychological treatments of adult depression in general. And so I, I will draw data from a large database we have collected in the past 14 years on psychological treatments of depression. So what we do is we, every year we make an update for our database. We do systematic searches in the literature and we collect all randomized trials on psychological treatments for depression. We now have more than 750 randomized trials uh, on psychological treatments for depression. So that's a lot. And we know a lot about psychological treatments of depression. I won't go too deep into that now. I will show only show a few key figure, figures to illustrate what we're talking about. Uh, if you want to know more about this database, you can go to www.metapsy.org. There you can find uh, the database itself uh, and a lot of the data also. And you can run your own meta-analysis by selecting subgroups of that. I will talk about this more in depth in, in my next seminar uh, later in September. Uh, but for now, it's uh, enough to that you know this data, that you know that this database exists, and that we can draw all this knowledge from this database about the effects of psychological treatments for depression. And I will I will uh, present the the effects in terms of effect sizes, Cohen's D, and a small uh, effect size is 0.2, moderate is 0.5, and large is 0.8. And as researchers, you know this, of course, uh, if, people working are, if people work in clinical practice, they may know the term effect size, but it's actually, it's not very clear what it means. Uh, what it means is that after treatment and you compare the treatment and control group with each other, uh, then the difference between uh, the treatment and control group in terms of standard deviations, that's the effect size. So if you have an effect size of 0.5, that means that the treated group uh, is 0.5 standard deviations better than the control group. But that's for a patient or for clinicians, that's not very, what does it mean? A patient wants to know uh, what's the chance of getting better and that an effect size doesn't say very much about that. So I've translated that also into numbers needed to be treated that indicates the number of people you need to treat in order to have one more recovered patient. So an effect size of 0.8 means that you have to treat four people in order to have one patient more recovered than in a control condition. Uh, so this is what we find for our for psychotherapies in general. For our, from our latest uh, update um, of January 2020. So we have uh, 357 studies, 441 comparisons between psychotherapies and control groups with 37,000 uh, patients. And here you see the effects we find for all different psychotherapies with at least 10 studies. So uh, you see CBT, behavioral activation, interpersonal psychotherapy, but also problem solving, psychodynamic therapies, third wave therapies. Um, we now have also added life review therapy, which is, which is used in older adults with depression. And what you see is that the effects are pretty large with effect sizes ranging from 0.37 to 103 and numbers needed to be treated ranging from, from three to nine. These effects sound uh, a bit different from each other, but when you adjust for all the other characteristics of the studies, the control groups, the, the, where the country was conducted, how they were recruited, et cetera, then you don't find significant differences between the effects of therapies. If you look at this table, you see that by far the most research has been done on CBT. 
229 of the 441 comparisons are about CBT. So CBT is by far the best studied type of therapy, but that doesn't mean it's more effective than other therapies. You see all the other therapies have comparable uh, effects. And as I said, in multivariate analysis, you don't find differences between therapies. One important thing is, of course, which control group you use. And uh, as you can see here, uh, waiting list control groups uh, typically find larger effects than care as usual or pill placebo or other control groups, which, make, which makes it very difficult to do meta-analysis with all these, this la these large groups of studies. But this is just to give you an idea of what, do we, what type of therapies do we have, what do we know about them, and what do we know about the effects. And so I want to focus now more on internet interventions. Um, are they effective? And how do they compare with face-to-face -face therapies? And I, I, uh, I, won't, I won't go into this too deep because uh, the, it's obvious that internet interventions have all kinds of advantages, but also some disadvantages. And what we usually do in internet interventions is that you, you explain to patients on the internet how they can apply a psychological treatment to themselves. Usually that's CBT, but that's not necessarily so, as I, I will show that later. Um, and what, the, what, what, what happens is that the patient goes to the internet, reads all the materials about depression, uh, uh, negative thinking, uh, activities, uh, pleasant activities, their role in how you feel. So it's basically an explanation of how you can apply an, an, a psychological treatment to yourself. And in many studies, the, there is human support. I will come back to that later. And when there is human support, the effects are larger. And the, but the, the type of support that the, the, the therapist gives is much more limited than in face-to-face -face therapies because the patient uh, actually does guided self-help. The patient applies the treatment to himself or herself. And the coach is just to help the patient. And that has all kinds of advantages. It's, it's cheaper, it saves time from the therapist, uh, saves traveling time for the patient. No, you can reduce waiting lists, less stigma. Patients can work on it whenever they want, in the evening when nobody sees them, less stigma. So it has all kinds of advantages. Uh, but there are also, of course, dangers and disadvantages. You need uh, good internet. Not everybody has that. Uh, it's, um, and not everybody likes it. There are a lot of people who hate it. They say, I, I just want to talk with somebody and I don't want to talk with a computer. I want to talk with a human being. Um, it's also difficult to diagnose people because you don't see them and you, it's, it's difficult to assess the more subtleties of uh, the diagnostics. So it has all kinds of advantages, some disadvantages, but the starting question is, do they work? Are they effective? And how does that compare to face-to-face -face treatments? So um, I, I will first start with a, an overview of comparative outcome studies. And that's relevant because it shows that types of therapies don't really differ in terms of effects. And that's important because then we can go to the next question. If types of therapies are comparable, how much can we minimize therapies without them losing effectiveness? So let's start with the first question. Are, do all therapies have comparable effects? And this is from a meta-analysis in, uh, for, it's an old one from 2008, but still relevant. Uh, what we did here is we took all the studies directly comparing one therapy to another. So patients were randomized either to CBT or interpersonal psychotherapy or to behavioral activation or psychodynamic therapy. And what you would expect is 
that if these treatments are, have comparable effects, that the effect size is zero, or at least not significant. And uh, so the effect size, as you see here, they indicate that uh, most therapies indeed do not have significant differences. And as you can see, CBT, uh, the effect size of CBT versus all other therapies is practically zero. No difference between CBT and other therapies. We did find that supportive therapy was a little less effective than other therapies, but that's probably caused by the fact that supportive therapy is used as a control condition in many studies. And it's, uh, but if people are well trained, uh, they uh, consider counsel supportive counseling as a true treatment, then you see that the effects are also comparable to the other ones. We also found here that interpersonal psychotherapy is a little better than other therapies, but that was not confirmed in later analysis. And as you can see, the number of trials here is pretty small. So there is, uh, we redid this meta-analysis. Uh, we redid this a couple of years later with a Swiss group and a large network meta-analysis of about 200 uh, randomized controlled trials. And again, we found no significant differences between types of therapy. We're redoing this meta-analysis now with about 350 trials. And what you, again, we find the same thing. No significant differences between therapies maybe accept uh, uh, counseling, but that has, as I said, other reasons. So, um, yeah, we come to the old dodo bird verdict, because that's, I don't know if, if uh, probably the psychologist and the psychotherapist among you uh, know this, but this is a discussion that goes back to the 1970s. You can look in uh, PubMed and fill in uh, Dodo Bird verdict as a search term, and you will get all these hits on uh, this issue. And it's it's actually uh, the discussion whether all treatments have comparable effects or not. Are they all effective, comparable, effective or not? And it it refers to a, a, a scene from Alice in Wonderland, where Alice and her friend are having a contest and are running around and. Uh, around through each other. And at some point the dodo bird says that the contest is over. And then Alice asks, uh, okay, but who has won? And then the dodo bird, for the, the dodo says, everybody has won and all should have prizes. Indicating, of course, in the discussion that all therapies have, uh, are equally effective. Um, but, of course, it's, it's much more, it's, it's not as easy as that. And if you want to read more about this, you should read my paper I wrote last year in the annual review of clinical psychology about the common factors model. Actually, we don't know. And uh, that's very much uh, relates to the problem that we can show if therapies work, that they work. But it's much harder to examine how they work. And we really don't know from any therapy, how they work. And so that's, that makes it very much complicated. We don't know whether therapies work through changing cognitions or through the alliance or through other common factors. And there are also alternative explanations for the uh, comparable effects of uh, therapies. I won't go into that in too deep because it goes too far for this talk. But if you, if you wanna read more, uh, you can go to this paper in the annual review of clinical psychology. But what is important is that is the question that comes up if you look at this conclusion. So if all therapies have comparable effects, what do we need at least for a therapy to be effective? Can we take off parts of a therapy without reducing the effects? Can we minimize interventions? without losing the effectiveness. And that's where internet interventions come in. From a public health perspective, this is highly relevant. If we can reduce, minimize interventions, then we have something to, to make 
interventions much more efficient and to apply them to much larger groups than we do than we can do now. So uh, I will go to uh, that question. Is internet therapy, has, does that have comparable effects uh, to face-to-face -face therapies? And this is, we examined this in a large network meta-analysis, which was published in JAMA Psychiatry in 2019. Uh, what we did is we only looked at CBT. So it's, um, uh, but we had 155 studies with 15,000 patients. And we had all studies on CBT, individual CBT, group CBT, telephone, guided self-help, uh, but also unguided self-help. Uh, and guided self-help included internet-based guided self-help, but also a few studies in which people got a self-help book and they were called uh, every week by a therapist. And we, we use, as comparators, we used waiting list, care as usual, and uh, pill placebo. And so we included all studies. Some compared individual therapy with waiting list, others compared individual with care as usual, more other studies compared individual therapy with group therapy or telephone therapy with unguided self help. So all the comparisons were pulled together in one big meta-analysis. And this is the network. Uh, here you can see, so the size of the circles indicates the, the number of patients in this, uh, or the number of studies in uh, uh, this uh, node. And the, the, the lines indicate, the thickness of the lines indicates the comparators that were available. And as you can see here, uh, there is a lot of research comparing individual CBT with care as usual, and a lot of research comparing guided self-help with wait list. But there's very little research comparing, and uh, no research comparing unguided CBT with telephone CBT. Uh, and there's, and pill placebo was only connected to individual therapy in a few studies, but not to anything else in a network. So what, what you do in a network, network meta-analysis is you, you take all these comparisons at once and do the analysis in one big uh, analysis altogether. And I will talk more about this in my next seminar where I will explain how this works and how you can do that and where you should focus on. But for now it's, imp for now it's important to understand that if you do a network analysis, meta-analysis like this, you use direct evidence, but also indirect evidence. So for example, uh, the best estimate of the difference between guided self-help and individual therapy is direct comparisons. And these studies indicate whether guided self-help and individual therapy have comparable effects. If after the treatment, the effect size is zero, they have comparable effects. But you, you can also use indirect evidence, meaning that individual therapy, if you, if you have studies comparing individual therapy with care as usual, and they say, for example, they find an effect size of 0.7. And then you have other studies comparing guided self-help with care as usual. And let's say they also have an effect size of 0.7. That means that they both have an effect size of 0.7 compared to care as usual, indicating that the difference between guided self-help and individual therapy is zero. Uh, no difference because they, compared to care as usual, they have the same effect. So we have direct evidence and indirect evidence. So in a network meta-analysis like this, you use all the available evidence in the most optimal way. It's more evidence is not available. So what did we find in this network uh, meta-analysis? This, this is the forest plot uh, uh, where with all the formats and we used care as usual as reference group. In the paper, you find all the other comparisons also, but just to give you an idea of the main results, 
what you what you what you see here is that the effects of therapies are all comparable there is no difference between group telephone individual or guided self-help and internet interventions guided internet interventions there is no uh, the effects are comparable and no significant difference the there is a difference with unguided self-help. So these are these internet interventions where you can go to as a patient and apply a, a, a therapy to yourself without human support. And what you can see here is that unguided self-help uh, has no significant effects when you compare it to care as usual. It is effective when you compare it with waitlist. Uh, but it's not significant when you compare it with um, uh, care as usual. So the main conclusion of this is that all treatment formats have comparable effects as long as there is human support. If there is no human support, you can give an intervention, but the effects are either small or non-significant. However, you have to, uh, what we also, we also looked at acceptability and we defined that very roughly a study dropout for any reason, which is a rough indication of acceptability. And we did find that the acceptability of guided self-help was significantly lower than for other treatment formats. And that, that means that if you work with a patient on the internet, you have to take care that, the, that, that patients don't drop out. The risk of dropping out is higher in internet-based interventions than in other uh, interventions. Okay, so that's, that's, I think that's an important message that it doesn't matter how you apply treatments. It doesn't, it doesn't matter why you do that individually in groups, telephone, guided internet intervention makes no, diff no significant difference uh, in terms of outcome, as long as there is human support. Then we go to the question, does that necessarily have to be CBT? No, it doesn't. I mean, CBT is very convenient because it has, um, uh, it has this a structure that you can easily translate into an internet intervention. It's easy because it's, the, it's psych, it has a psychoeducational nature. You explain to people about depression, about thinking, about feeling, about behavior, uh, how negative thoughts can influ influence how you feel, how, what you, how pleasant activities can influence what you feel and what you do and what you think and so it's it's easy to explain you can make homework assignments you can do tests online uh, that which makes which make it easier but basically it doesn't necessarily have to be cbt in this study which we did with our swedish colleagues we took a psychodynamic self-help book and translated that into an internet intervention. And so what we found is that it's, that it's basically, uh, the effects were good, no, no, no indication that it was less effective than uh, CBT. And there are, is, there are now also more and more studies coming up on interpersonal psychotherapy uh, using an internet-based format. So CBT has all kinds of advantages because it's relatively easy to translate into an internet intervention, but it's not necessarily so. You can use any, any, any intervention for translating that into an internet intervention. The next question is, who can deliver these treatments? Because as I said, it's different from face-to-face -face therapies. You don't do individual therapy sessions. And what, a, what, what a, a therapist in internet interventions can do is you can, you can deliver these uh, therapies. You know, the studies we work with have 
five to eight online sessions. And that means that um, uh, uh, patients do, that, do them every week, once a week. And a, the coach or the therapist writes emails and gives feedback and encourages patients to continue with the intervention. And that takes about 20 minutes uh, per week. So the in time investment is pretty low. Um, uh, but, but, but patients do develop an alliance with, with an online therapist, even though that's the time investment is pretty low. And what we do in our, in our studies is we train clinical master uh, students to deliver these treatments. And we use the formats of the IAP program in the United Kingdom. I don't know if you know the IAP program. It's, it stands for Increasing Access to Psychological Therapies. And it was, it's a large program to, yeah, to, to uh, allow people, more people to get treatment for depression and anxiety. And they work in a stepped care model, meaning that in principle, patients first get guided self-help. And if that doesn't work, then they get more intensive therapy. Uh, but in that first phase, low intensity CBT, uh, that's where that's an, an internet-based interventions is a type of low intensity CBT. And they train uh, 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 coaches or they call it psychological well-being practitioners in six months with three months theory and three months uh, practicing. And we use that, uh, that type of, of uh, training to tr also to train our coaches. So you do, don't need fully trained psychological, uh, uh, clinical psychologist, psychotherapist or whatever. It can be less. Of course, as I said, uh, you shouldn't uh, forget that internet interventions also have a, lo a, lot of, uh, a lot of disadvantages. I mean, people participating in these trials, they are the ones who are willing to be randomized to either internet interventions or face-to-face -face interventions. We don't know whether that's representative for people visiting outpatient mental health centers. We just don't know. And, so, um, uh, and I, um, we also know, for example, that you can also deliver guided self-help through a book and a telephone. Um, and I have not seen or not got any indication that that's less effective than doing this through the internet. So uh, I, I, I think internet-based interventions have a lot of possibilities and opportunities. And our, the research we have done until now shows that in terms of efficacy, they don't differ from face-to-face -face therapies. Um, but it's really efficacy research. And if you, uh, it's not, that doesn't mean it works always in every situation for everybody. And you really have to examine where and for whom this works. And that's where most of the research at this time is focusing on. Where and how can we apply this knowledge that in principle, these interventions work? You can think, for example, of for, about prevention. Can we uh, prevent the onset of major depression in people with subthreshold depression by offering them an internet intervention? We can develop independent internet treatment clinics. Uh, they, you don't need a building if you want to deliver internet treatments. And you see these virtual clinics coming up all over the world. Um, you, can, you can apply them in primary care, that a GP um, uh, is less, maybe less inclined to only give antidepressants and give also people the opportunity to participate in uh, psychological treatments through the internet. You can think of specialized mental health care where you can blend psychological face-to-face uh, -face therapies with online interventions where you treat people online normally, but say to them, you can do a social skills training on an internet module. Um, or, um, uh, you can think of general medical care, hospitals, 
people with diabetes and depression or heart disease and depression, where you can integrate into internet interventions in the rehabilitation programs. Or you can think of uh, other settings like schools and universities or the workplace where you can offer this kind of intervention as prevention or as early intervention to people with uh, sub-threshold or coming up uh, depression. You can also think of low and middle income countries where there's no infrastructure for mental health care yet. And you, can, you could use internet-based interventions as a first building block to build up uh, uh, mental health care. So it has all these different opportunities and possibilities uh, to apply the knowledge that in principle, these interventions work. But we really need a lot of research in all these different fields and areas to see whether it also works in that area, in this target group, in this country. And uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of research going on now on all these different aspects. And so what I will do now is I will give a few examples of projects on all these different aspects uh, which, which I have been involved in in the last couple of years. And let's see how, I, how am I doing in terms of time. Okay, I will, I will be ready in about 10 minutes. So the first example, um, preventing the onset of major depression and sub depression. We were very fortunate that this paper was published in JAMA in 2016. This trial we did with a German group with uh, David Ebert and Matthias Berking. And what we did is uh, we recruited people with subthreshold depression. And so we did a diagnostic interview at the, at the start of the, of, of, the, of the study. And so we if people met diagnostic criteria for major depression, they were excluded. And we only included people who did have subthreshold depression, so depressive symptoms, which they suffered from, but not major depression. And we randomized them to a preventive intervention or care as usual. Um, and the preventive intervention was online uh, PSD and behavioral activation with weekly support by a coach. And then after one year, we again did a diagnostic interview. How many people developed uh, major depressive disorder in the intervention group and in the control group? And what we found is that in the intervention group, 27% of the patients developed major depression compared to 41% in the control group which stands for a hazard ratio of 0.59 and the numbers needed to be treated of six, which is pretty good for this kind of uh, intervention. So yes, in some cases, at least internet-based interventions can prevent the onset of major depression. The second uh, example is from my colleague, led from a study led by my colleague Tara Donker um, on it's not on depression, but on anxiety. It's a virtual reality app for acrophobia, so fear of heights. And it's a, um, it was published in JAMA Psychiatry a couple of years ago, 2019, I think. So and the, the idea was to develop a VR app on a mobile phone, and then people buy a card box you know, these paper things, uh, $5, they cost almost nothing. They cost a few dollars and you can slide your phone into it. And then you, it, it looks like you have these VR glasses, but actually it's your phone and a card box. Um, and as she developed this VR mobile app for acrophobia, it's unguided. So there's no human support in it. And so uh, this is how it looks like. It's uh, uh, you, you have the, it's, it's a theater and you have this elevator. You can move the elevator yourself up and down again. So it's, it's of course based on exposure and uh, you, you, you uh, handle the elevator yourself in the app. 
So you you can go up and get used to the fear, etc., and then you go can go further up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's that's how the app works. And here is another screenshot uh, from the roof of the theater where you can look down. Yeah, what we so we randomized about two hundred people to either xerophobia or the weightless control group, and uh, what we found is pretty large effects on. Uh, uh, anxiety and effects are a, compar a comparison between the waitlist and the intervention with an effect size of 1.14, which is pretty impressive. Uh, dropout was not so very high. Most people completed the intervention. Most people reached criteria for clinical significant change. So that was uh, pretty, was very nice uh, study. And Tara is now uh, working on all kinds of other uh, VR apps uh, like this. So the last uh, project I want to focus on is on uh, what we call individual patient data meta-analysis. Uh, I will also talk about this in depth uh, in uh, the next seminar, uh, but we have done all kinds of I IPD, uh, individual patient data meta-analysis. Uh, but a few of them are on internet interventions. And what you, the problem with normal randomized trials is that you don't have statistical power to examine for whom they work. So if you want to examine predictors and moderators, you don't have enough power in one trial because each trial has the power to find significant effects, not to find predictors. And if you want to find predictors, you need many more uh, participants. But individual trials don't do that. Um, so, but if you collect all the primary data from all the trials, you do have sufficient statistical power to look at uh, uh, who benefits from this treatment and who benefits less. And uh, we did a few of these. Uh, one was, uh, uh, it's my colleague, Irini Kariotaki, who leads this uh, research under my supervision. And uh, she, uh, we published this paper in JAMA Psychiatry, I think in 2017, on unguided internet interventions. And this one is uh, in 2018 in Clinical Psychology Review on guided internet-based interventions. And the nice thing about this field is that, um, yeah, we know people. It's a pretty small community of, of active researchers. And they know us, we know them, and they are, you, most of them, almost all of them just give the data to us so that we can pool all these data into one big data set. And we reach, uh, uh, we, we get, uh, you know, more than 90% of the trials in this field. And uh, if we do not get the, the do not get the data, it's usually the IRBs that object to that. So, uh, but we managed to get these huge data sets, uh, and so we were managed. We we were able to look at who benefits from these interventions and who doesn't. And what we we found no significant predictors for unguided interventions. That's probably because the effects are so sm so small. So then it's very difficult to see differences between groups of patients, even though we have this high statistical power. But we did find differences for guided internet interventions. And contrary to what you would expect is that we've, we found better outcomes for all the participants. You would think that you know, young people are interested in technology, used to work with computers, mobile phones, etc., and that they that it works better in younger people. But that's not the case. It works better in older people. We also found that uh, it works less well in ethnic minorities, and that's uh, yeah, that's that's important, and we have to look into that in more depth and what we can do about that. And the third thing we found is that uh, people with more severe depression benefit more. That's again, not what you would expect. You would expect, okay, internet interventions are nice and fun and uh, interesting 
but they only work for people with mild to moderate depression. If people have severe depression, you should give them another treatment. That's not what we find. We find that the interventions work better when severity is higher. Um, yeah, what we're doing now, uh, unfortunately, I cannot get the results because they're submitted now, but we're, what we're doing uh, is an individual patient data network meta-analysis. So then we get all the data from all these trials uh, on unguided inter internet interventions, guided internet interventions, compared to waitlist, care as usual, but also guided versus unguided. And then we can examine who needs guided interventions and for whom is unguided interventions enough. And that's fascinating, but as I said, I cannot talk about that now because the results are still submitted. But there's a lot going on in this field. Another thing you can do with uh, internet interventions with a IPD meta-analysis is, is that you can look at negative effects. Individual trials cannot do that because they don't have the power. Uh, deterioration is something that doesn't, fortunately, doesn't happen very often. So in one trial, you cannot look at deterioration, but you can do that in a larger uh, trials. So, uh, in in one, one IPD meta-analysis on guided internet intervention, 18 trials with 2,000 patients, in unguided internet uh, intervention, 16 trials with 3,800 uh, participants. By, now the, the numbers are much higher. Uh, but what we, what we fortunately found is that people with clinical significant deterioration the was was lower in the internet interventions than in the in the comparison groups which is good news of course as i said not everything works and we really need to examine in each situation whether these interventions work and i i showed you a few of our successes and then it sounds good and you have these nice papers and good results and good journals but we have also a lot of failures. And we shouldn't forget that that's what research is about. It's not just finding good things. It's also, especially in this field, it's also important to remember that not everything works. And so we did a few, tri two trials in people on waiting list for specialized mental health care. And we thought, okay, if, we, if, there is, if they're waiting, on a waiting list for specialized mental health care, we can give them an internet-based treatment. Maybe they already recover by the time they get to the face-to-face -face therapy. Or if they get the face-to-face -face therapy, then maybe uh, they need less therapy time. No, it didn't work. So that we find small effects of the interventions, at least for, the, for a depression. Uh, but we found no effect on uh, the, uh, the outcome after the therapy. We found no effect on a reduced number of treatment sessions or an economic cost. So it didn't work. Uh, we did a trial on internet-based problem solving for Turkish people in the Netherlands, no significant effects. We did a trial on internet-based prevention of depression in employees with depressive symptoms in large Dutch companies, no significant effects. So what I, what I mean is uh, it is, and it remains important to examine the effects of internet inter interventions, depending on the setting uh, where you wanna use it. <clears throat> okay, I will use the last few minutes to uh, talk about the future. Uh, and I, I Talking about the future is very risky. And I, I always try to illustrate it with this picture. This is a picture from the 1950s about how they thought that a home computer would look like in 50 years time, 50 years later. So um, uh, that's um, you. And yeah, I think it makes clear that you shouldn't make predictions about the future. Uh, in this field because it's so completely wrong. You know, of course, that this computer, um, if it exists, it could only do a fraction of what my 
mobile phone gandu now. Uh, so the fu most funny thing is that uh, well, I made it yellow and it says, with the teletype interface and the Fortran language, the computer will be easy to use. Well, it doesn't look like that to me. But uh, that's what you, uh, th that's always a warning uh, if you talk about the future. It's better not to talk about the future because you will be wrong anyway. But you can look at developments in our fields. And um, if you look at internet based interventions, there are many, in many ways, traditional research. They started 20 years ago. Uh, so I got my first grant on an internet intervention in 1998. That's when the internet came up and became more common uh, to, to more, more and more people started using it. And, uh, but what we did at that, at that time, and that's still the way that many trials work, is you just take a, face -to a manual of a face-to-face -face therapy and you translate it into in internet-based interventions with sessions, education, tests, and all that. But in many ways, they're just, yeah, you know, traditional psychological treatments. But that's not, um, uh, but now you see the mobile revolution and people don't sit behind their computers anymore to work on an internet intervention. They wanna want it, want it on their tablet, on their phone. And a phone is completely different because you have it with you all the time. And if you do an internet intervention on your computer, you fill in how you felt today or this week. But on your phone, you can do that real time. You can fill in now uh, how you feel. And so uh, and you, with a mobile phone with all these sensors in it, you can collect huge data sets with all kinds of information about um, uh, depression and things that may be related to depression. And so you get these huge data sets and the use of the internet in real time, that's really a revolution also for internet interventions. And so uh, um, what you also see, of course, we have all these uh, thousands of apps uh, uh, for mental health problems. And they, they focus usually on one small intervention, mindfulness or cognitive restructuring or behavioral activation because a phone is used in a completely different way as a computer. You look at it uh, 100 times a day, but never look at it longer than uh, 30 seconds, so to say. And so it's, that's very different from sitting behind your computer and doing an intervention. So, but how to do that and what works and what doesn't work, we really don't know. Uh, uh, and in the combination with the big data and the machine learning, artificial intelligence opportunities, we really don't know where this field is going, but it will change rapidly and quickly and uh, enormously. What we do see is a large increase in number of trials on apps for uh, mental health. And uh, we did a meta-analysis last year with Jake Linarden in World Psychiatry, and we found 60 randomized trials. While the year before, there were only 20 randomized trials. So this field explodes. And this year, there are, there are more and more uh, trials on internet interventions. The effects are still modest, and they don't compare to the normal uh, internet-based interventions. But it's, I, th I think it's a matter of time and it's a matter of exploring how you can use it. What, you, what can you do on the mobile phone and what can you not do on the mobile phone? So that's a pretty exciting uh, development. Okay, I come to my conclusions. Internet-based interventions for depression, but also for anxiety disorders are, are effective in principle. The challenge is to implement them in healthcare and to examine where and how and for whom they are effective. Uh, but it's also changing very rapidly now. Uh, but even if you, even with that, I have no doubt that uh, in the coming year, in the next 10 years, the internet and the mobile apps will have a huge impact on mental healthcare uh, in general. 
And with that, I want to come to my conclusion, and I want to thank you for your attention. Of course, we now have time for uh, chatting and questions and things like that. But if you want to send me an email with something, you come up later or uh, you want to contact me, send me an email. If you want to know more about myself, look at my personal website where you find all kinds of tools and information about me. So uh, thank you very much. That's it. And I will stop share my stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, uh, Professor Kuypers. Um, may I invite my colleagues and the attendees to uh, thank your uh, wonderful presentations. And uh, uh, Pem, you may uh, you may want to take a glass of water and just relax, and uh, uh, and we continue from here. While you are presenting your exciting and up to date work, and also you have uh, demonstrated to us how uh, being self-critical about your work, uh, we have uh, colleagues uh, putting in, I think altogether almost uh, 20 exciting questions. I invite you to scan through those questions, uh, Pam, but at the same time, when I look at those uh, 20, uh, close to 20, 19 questions, I can boldly divide them into uh, two main categories. If you don't mind, maybe, we proceed in this fashion. I think the uh, first category of question is about uh, depression itself. I think the audience uh, uh, are very eager to hear from the world expert. Is it okay, uh, Pem? We, 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 we chat about uh, depression for a little while. Uh, oh. Yeah, please tell us, what was your latest kind of impression, depression and culture? Are we seeing more and more and more depression or what? Are we seeing change in our gene pool? We are seeing more display of diagnosed uh, depression, for example. Um, uh, I, in my, uh, I, I mean, you, there is a lot of research on this. And uh, uh, in, if I look at the research, I think there is no major change in prevalence rates of depression. No major. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. So what, what we do see is that there is a, a, a difference across cultures, uh, but within cultures, it's relatively stable. Mm -hmm. uh, and the differences between cultures, they're also not that big. And they're also, you know, influenced by cultural, uh, yeah, cultural issues. Like um, many cultures don't know the word depression. And so, so uh, we, I just saw a study in which they talked about thinking too much, mm -hmm. which is very similar to depression. And so it's also, you know, what is depression? And, and, and we have all these criteria for depression, but you have, to, uh, you, you have to remember that that doesn't fit into all the cultures. Mm -hmm. um, and then the question, does it increase or not? Uh, there are a few studies in, uh, uh, in the US, um, uh, but also, for example, in Holland, where they, and in Australia, where they use the same diagnostic instruments uh, with, uh, in, in a time span of 10 years. And for example, the studies in the Netherlands, they did not show that depression, that, that they, 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 the, the prevalence is comparable. No difference in prevalence. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the, it depends very much on the instrument you use to measure depression. And that, that could give indications that it's rising or anything, but uh, I don't think it's very convincing. If you use strict diagnostic interviews, right. then you don't see an increase. Yes. What we do see is that the treatment seeking rates explode. Right. So the number of people seeking treatment, mm -hmm. that increases very much. Mm -hmm. And that depends, of course, on the income level of the country. Right. But right. in the high income countries uh, uh, in the West, you see that the, you know, the treatment seeking rates have uh, gone up 400% mm -hmm. in the last uh, decades. And so I think that the same is happening in the upper middle income countries in China and uh, in East Asia. 
And you also see a lot of, for example, a lot of research now uh, on psychological therapies in East Asia. Yes, yes. Well, maybe just one last question on topics of depression, because the list of questions growing very, very fast. We are talking about 26 questions now. Depression, last one. Uh, Professor Kakos, the question is, uh, what, what is the kind of uh, yak state to measure recovery from depression? What are the key measures, yaksteaks? To measure recovery, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, I, 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 that's that's a pretty that's a complicated question mm -hmm. because uh, if you really want to do it well, you should do a diagnostic interview to see whether whether somebody meets criteria or not. But that's of course very the diagnostic threshold. Yeah, and I think the PHQ is a very good uh, measure to just you know it's nine questions, the PHQ nine, people can rate it very quickly, and it gives a good indication. Uh, of course, if you treat a person, if you're a clinician and you, uh, you, you treat a person, it's much better. You, you can just talk about the patients, about the current symptoms and whether the person feels good enough uh, to stop treatment and all that. So you can do that in a clinical uh, discussion. I do think when you measure recovery, however you do that, it's important to look at the relapse uh, uh, risk because we know that people who are treated for depression and are recovered, that the, that the, re, that the relapse rates are very high. Mm -hmm. So it's important to, uh, to either give a relapse prevention program uh, or to, uh, if people have had a few disorders before, to contact them every couple of months to see how things are going. Mm -hmm. uh, because this relapse rate is really very, Clinically, it's a very important thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you. Well, I think we move to the uh, to a different space, talking about uh, internet-based intervention. And again, uh, uh, Pim, I invite you to uh, scan the list of the questions on the Q and A. We uh, we grew up to twenty five now. Um, a lot to to look at, but there are a few things that jump out for me, if I may. Uh, 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 direct one or two questions to, to you and, uh, and, and we take it from there. I guess before we talk about the, the big thing and that is, uh, I think there's a, pri a primary uh, uh, safety question. It goes very easy. Uh, is it uh, increasing the suicidal risk when we uh, talk to people on, on the internet uh, in terms of the, the, the risk level? As far as I know, there is no indication that it increases suicidality. Mm -hmm. So there is no, uh, I don't think there is any risk for that. Mm -hmm. But of course, it depends on if you're, if you're treating patients, it's always important to keep suicide risk uh, in, uh, in mind. And uh, I know here from the Netherlands that a lot of clinicians still prefer to see suicidal patients in person. Mm -hmm. despite the corona uh, situation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's, it's important to raise this all, also if you do internet interventions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of internet interventions have uh, in-between uh, assessments. So you fill in the PHQ or another instrument, which includes a suicide question. So mm -hmm. if somebody scores on that suicide question, you should have a suicide protocol. So you contact person, uh, talk about suicidality, and uh, if needed, you, you take more measures. But there is no reason to assume that internet interventions increase the risk of suicidality. Mm -hmm. Anyways, the uh, risk, you are not seeing the evidence of that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, and, and then there are, uh, moving on, there are a couple of basic explanatory kind of uh, questions. Can you, can you explain to us uh, uh, briefly what you mean by guided internet intervention versus unguided internet interventions? Yes, I, 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 I tried to uh, explain that during my talk, but I understand that's, uh, that's not so easy. So what internet interventions do is they, you put a um, psychological treatment online. That's the basics. You put take CBT, uh, a manual for CBT, 
you put all the psychoeducational materials on the internet, you make homework assignments for every week that the patients work on it. You have all kinds of tests that people have to fill in and they get feedback about that. And you can do that. You can make such an online intervention uh, without support. So for example, Moochin is, uh, you, you can just go to the, uh, to Moochin, which is an unguided internet intervention, which is used a lot across the world. I think it's translated into uh, Mandarin also. I, I don't think in Cantonese, but uh, I think it's available in Mandarin. And you, um, um, uh, you just go there and you get no support. And that's, that's unguided internet intervention, mm -hmm. un unguided internet intervention. So you say the resources it's a, there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's just on the internet and you just do it uh, online. Mm -hmm. But if you have a guided internet intervention, that means that there is a human support for you while you go through the internet mm -hmm. intervention. Mm -hmm. Usually uh, weekly emails or chatting in between can be by telephone, it doesn't really matter, but there is a human supporting you. Thank you. Uh, another sort of uh, please explain further question. Can you expand on the topics of uh, how to enhance the internet-based intervention adherence? How can we maintain, how, how, how can we engage people? Yes, that's an important thing. Because, uh, as I said, the drop out uh, from the internet, from internet interventions is high. And that's, but you, you do have to remember that drop out from an internet intervention may be something different from drop out from face to face therapy. Because uh, in internet therapy, it's easier to just stop talking, not responding to email. Well, if you go somewhere, uh, with a person, then it's uh, then that the, the the threshold to drop out is higher. So it's very well possible that people feel better and think, okay, I'm done with this intervention because I feel good again and it has helped me a lot, and I just stop. And that's also drop out. So we don't know exactly what it means. Okay. Um, but it, if you want to reduce it, there's a there's there's a lot of research on how you. Uh, should, uh, what you should do to reduce the dropout rate. It starts with the intervention. So you have to make an intervention which meets the needs of the people who use it. And so we now, in our interventions, we work with UX designers. They are specialized in designing internet sites so that people use it and people know uh, 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 that, 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 that people like it and you take the good format. It's not too, too much this, not too much that. Sentences are not too long, enough video. Mm -hmm. So it's really a matter of making the website as user-friendly as possible. That's very important. Mm -hmm. that, and then in the support, uh, you can also do a lot of things. So it's important to say to people from the beginning, the chance of dropping out is very high. I and see. I'm here to, uh, to help you working through this. Can you please let me know if you want to drop out and let me know uh, the moment you don't want to respond anymore. Can you please let me know that? Because it's, we know this is a risk and we have to. Uh, the other thing is that during the, the support you give to patients while they work through the internet intervention, is to give positive feedback and encouragement to continue. Uh, because that's, uh, uh, that's, I think that's the most basic part of what you do when you give the support to patients. Thank you. I think they are very practical. You talk about the, uh, the presentation of the website and also let people know ahead in terms of what the uh, challenges may be. Uh, talking about internet uh, engagement and also uh, uh, maintaining a good adherence, I think there is a question also about uh, uh, using internet for diagnosis. 
uh, we spend a lot of time on, on intervention. And earlier you talked about the limitation of using internet-based material for diagnosis. Can, can you elaborate on that, please? Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, what's... Um, so doing a diagnostic interview through the internet, I think you can do that uh, by telephone or by face-to-face. Uh, by -face. There's no difference with... Uh, 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 you, you can do that in any format. There's reason. So for the diagnostic interviews, it also does, it's, it's a clinician interviewing a patient. And it doesn't matter uh, whether you do that face-to-face, -face, by telephone, by Skype or whatever. So there's research on that, at least comparing face, individual face-to-face -face with telephone diagnostic interviews. And there's no difference. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's, that's the first thing. Then you have all these questionnaires which can be, uh, they're, they're, most of them are developed for use and on paper and pencil. And you can use them on the internet uh, or uh, online. There is a risk because it's not always the same. So the psychometric properties can change a little uh, on uh, when you move it to the internet because the situation in which people fill it in is different. Um, but of course, the, the, the internet offers all kinds of opportunities uh, to uh, simplify questionnaires. So, uh, of course, we have uh, computer adapted testing where you, uh, and it's based on if you have a questionnaire uh, of, let's say, 25 items, which uses one construct, for example, depression. Uh, you can use the uh, uh, item response uh, theory to select uh, the next question based on the answer to the first question. Oh, okay. yep. So then you and you start. Uh, uh, so if people are uh, suicidal, by the way, you don't have to ask whether they feel well, <laughs> because you if they're suicidal, you you know they don't feel well. Mm -hmm. So you 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 uh, you answer uh, the, you give people the next question that estimates in the best way the final outcome. And uh, so you, 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 usually you go from question one to 25, but then computer adapted testing, you go from, in this patient, you go from one to five to nine to 30 to, and then the next patient, you go from one to two to 13 to, so you, and you, the more questions you get, the better the estimate of the outcome is. And uh, uh, so it depends a little on the individual, but usually you find that uh, you, after half of the question, you can be certain what the outcome is. So you don't need the rest of the items. Uh, so you can reduce the diagnostics for the patients considerably mm -hmm. using uh, uh, this CATS computer adaptive testing. Thank you. It, is, it does require quite a few um, uh, calc. You need what you need is large sample sizes. Mm. So you have to you need thousands of patients who have filled in uh, the questionnaires because you need you need all the combinations, so to say. Okay. So you need large sample sizes, but that's really really very nice. And you need computer power, so to say, because it's you you. Uh, you do the calculations online and it's it's pretty complicated but it i mean in the future this will be the this is the future thank you i think it's a very helpful clarification to use uh, uh, to conduct the assessment in a more dynamic uh, interactive way through uh, the 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 internet uh, platform um, there are heaps of questions, and now it's 22, <laughs> and we have uh, eight minutes left. What I will do is I, I like to direct one or more, one or two questions to you. And um, Professor Kybers, I don't know whether you, when you scan the list, I don't know whether there are one or two sort of jumps out for you, and you really want to respond. Um, Sorry, I, I've been talking too much. So I, okay. I well, uh, let, let me continue chatting with you then. Uh, hey, I, I, I have a question here from my colleague. I think it's a good question. Let, let me read it out for you. Um, could there be the case that face-to-face uh, -face and e-health intervention, they actually have different active ingredients? 
even though the content is similar. But because we're doing it face to face and we're doing it through the internet, then they both have different active ingredients. What are your thoughts? Well, that's an interesting question. That is possible. The problem is that we don't know what active ingredients are for any therapy. For so any we don't know uh, what active ingredients are, not for face-to-face -face CBT. But except, for except the one you repeat a couple of times, human uh, 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 support. Well, yes, but that doesn't mean that human support is uh, the, 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 uh, the core element of it. We mm. don't know that. Mm -hmm. So it's very well possible that in a couple of years' time, we will have uh, good artificial intelligence-driven apps, which are as good as face-to-face -face therapies. Wow. We don't know. We don't know. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, uh, it could be the case. Uh, but there is a lot of research on uh, the alliance between patients and, and therapists. And what, what, you, what these studies show is that there is a strong association between the alliance and the outcome. Yeah. But what, what, what these studies usually do is that they measure outcome and alliance before and after therapy. Mm -hmm. So you know that people, uh, that the alliance gets better and that the outcome gets better. But you don't know what comes first. It's mm -hmm. also very well possible that people feel they get better and then think, oh, this must be a good therapist. I like it. Mm -hmm. We don't know. So you need a temporal association. You have to show that the, uh, that the building of the alliance comes before the improvement in symptoms. So you need a lot of measurements. Mm. For the alliance, there is some research on that, indicating indeed that the alliance is indeed the core element. Mm -hmm. But this is all correlational research. Understand. It's very well possible that, uh, uh, that, that the change in the alliance and the change in the outcomes is explained by a third variable, which you have not measured. Mm -hmm. So you need research in which you measure both but also a lot of other variables that may influence both the alliance. And we don't have that research. Very good. Even if you would find that you're not there. Mm -hmm. This is the problem of causality, which, which we know from epidemiology uh, for in, in general and all research in, the, in general. Mm -hmm. We do not have causal research on what are the active ingredients mm -hmm. of interventions. Causal, in particular, in a causal relationship. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, uh, scanning the questions, I have two or three exciting topics I, I want to raise uh, before we finish. We can't, we can't avoid this question. Uh, can, can you tell us what are the uh, one or two, three key ethical principles when we investigate, when we embark on this internet mental health journey? Uh, that's an important thing. Yeah, I, 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 I think basically also the ethics are very comparable uh, between face-to-face -face and internet therapy. To begin with. I mean, if we now look at the corona crisis, a lot of mental health care uh, uh, people delivering therapy have have been forced to move to online delivery by telephone, by Skype or whatever. And so there, there is not a basic difference between delivering therapies online or face-to-face. Uh, -face. Mm -hmm. There are risks. I mean, there are risks that you, uh, uh, that you, that you don't see the subtleties of uh, having a patient in front of you. Uh, but I think you should mostly uh, be c concerned about suicidality. Mm -hmm. But you can, you can do much of that online too, by just asking about it, just talking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do in between evaluations, just ask for suicidality. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I don't think there is a basic difference okay. in other ethical issues. Being a good, competent, and a safe practitioner to begin with. Exactly. Yeah, thank exactly. you. Um, yeah. Second last sort of big topics. Uh, we talked you talk about the mobile evolution already. A, tell us one or two exciting things. And B, what is what are your initial impressions so far? Are we doing well? Are we are we on the right track? Are we getting better outcomes? Any any thoughts? Yeah, I think the the uh, the the the, uh, the artificial intelligence is really very promising, really very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But until now, I have not seen things we can actually use clinically. Oh, I see. And I've seen over the over the past decades, I have seen a lot of promising new developments. But in the treatment of depression, they have not led yet to things that improve outcomes. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, 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 we have to be very careful. Okay. And it's really very exciting, and we really have to try and do this. Uh, but if I, but I mean, what excites me a lot is if I look at these mobile apps. Like, do you know Wobot? I don't know if you know it, but it's an app. It's a, it's a chat uh, app, and it's it's completely directed by uh, it's it's uh, it's unguided, but you just talk with an with an app Wobot, and I th I think it's fascinating. It's great. It's and what what will uh, what will happen is that if a lot of people work with Wobot or all one of these other uh, fascinating apps, what, what will happen is that you get more and more um, uh, data in these apps and they, the, the data sets uh, of these apps will grow and grow and grow and grow. In a, over, and in a couple of years, they have so much data, they, they can start much better predicting what they should say when a patient says this and not when a patient says that. And so the artificial intelligence in robot will learn, so to say, what to answer. And then we, we grow towards human support. And that's really very exciting. We're not there. We don't know the risks. We're, I haven't seen any applications of it that really work or improve outcomes. But in our case, it would also already be a major step forward if we would not need the human support. And of course, the effects of these interventions will also be limited. And we will always need therapists for when these interventions would not work, would not be enough uh, to work with people with chronic depression who don't benefit from anything. But if we could start with unguided interventions and start with uh, uh, yeah, uh, helping the, uh, the first batch of people uh, without human support, that's really exciting. And I think we grow there. It will take time, but apps like robots, are, I think they're great and are wonderful and they are- well, just like I, was, I can see your eyes bigger and bigger and getting so excited but but yet but yet i think your remark is uh, crucial that uh, we are seeing the uh, the the rapid growth of knowledge the 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 operation and that it down but using it clinically uh, still a long way to go or still quite a way to go so i think this uh, impression is uh, very important uh, we got 32 questions uh, i'm not doing a good host here my thinking is perhaps we're going to see you very soon again, literally another month. There may be a room uh, in the next session to respond to some of the questions if you want to, or maybe we can work with you. Hey, perhaps the way to uh, conclude today is, I think this is a good question. You may remember at the beginning, we talked about depression and culture. What is your impression about cultural differences when we're using it clinically, using internet-based intervention? Do you pick up any kind of uh, uh, cultural differences in terms of um, readiness, that kind of thing? Yeah, I don't think that's a difference. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a lot of research on uh, uh, psychotherapies in general in across the world. 
in North America, Europe, Australia, but also there's a lot of research now in East Asia, mm -hmm. uh, in, in uh, South Asia, Africa, South America. And what, what I see is that the effects of psychotherapies are actually a li little higher in non-Western countries. Non-Western countries. Not all of them, not all of these therapies have been culturally adapted mm -hmm. and they still work. So I, I, I have no reason to doubt that psychological treatments work anywhere in the world where people have internet, mm -hmm. uh, where people, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more about people have to recognize they are depressed. They have to have to have the space to do something about it, have to have some resources to do something about it. But if they have access to internet, if they can and are willing to apply psychological treatments, I don't think there is any reason to assume yeah. that they don't work. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, if, as long as the material is uh, culturally accessible, linguistically accessible, uh, exactly. they will, that, that will be a good starting uh, point. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Kaipers. Uh, I think you have been delivering an excellent lecture and we have a good 45 minutes uh, interrogation. Okay, I'm sorry. Hey, a um, couple of things. Uh, number one, the PowerPoint availability. We will discuss with uh, the speaker if uh, with his permission, uh, we will circulate the PowerPoint. Number two, among the questions, there are one or two to or three already about the uh, uh, matters concerning meta-analysis, things like that. So I just want to let you know, literally a month time, 28 September, Professor Kuypers will be joining us again and talking about another exciting topic, next generation of meta-analysis. I, I really look forward uh, to that. And uh, I, I invite people to, to join us uh, as well. Uh, well, I think pretty much we come to the end. Hey, Professor Kuypers, do you have last one or two sentences, words you want to share with us to conclude? Yes, it was a pleasure to give this talk. And it's, uh, I see the questions now, and they're really good questions. Yeah. I'm sorry that I don't have the time to answer them all. But uh, if somebody has a question, just send me an email and I will be happy to answer it online. And uh, uh, yeah, I want to thank everybody for uh, listening to me uh, and to uh, be so involved in, in what I said. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kuypers. You have been extremely generous to us, not only presenting to us, just to let the audience know. Professor Kuypers even went ahead to prepare a pre-record lecture just in case the technology doesn't work. Funny, funny. Uh, but again, you are very, very generous to be uh, prepared to respond to our questions. So we will stay in touch and uh, take it from here as the first chapter going to the next chapter. If time permits, we will try to address some of the questions again. And I agree with you so much. Those are very, very good questions, very high level and uh, inviting questions as well. Guys, uh, thank you so much for your interest in this uh, lecture. And also, I just can't thank enough our speaker today. Please join me to thank uh, Professor Kuypers, okay? Thank you so much. So, uh, Dean, Professor Hayward, anything you want to say? Uh, I think uh, you have uh, uh, said it all, Samson. Uh, thanks again to Professor Kuypers, but yeah, it's been a wonderful, wonderful session. Uh, and we look forward to another one uh, in about a month's time. So thank you, thank, thank you both. Indeed, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, bye bye guys. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Pim, that was wonderful. Uh, thank you, it was a pleasure. We'll, we'll see you again soon. Yes, see you. Is question around, question chat? If you're around, do you want to show your face? Yeah. I think he's in the participant group, and so I'm not oh, sure. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, okay. Anyway, uh, thank you so much, uh, Pim, and uh, you have done exceedingly well uh, in uh, uh, soliciting those uh, uh, very changing questions. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's, yeah. Ni it's, it's nice to, to get to talk like this, so it's my pleasure. And the, te and the technology works. That's the best part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. See you. Okay. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.